I always like those little jingles that they put on those sermon videos. I like that a lot. Come on, if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord, come on, put your hands together like this. Hallelujah. God is good, and we just love him so much. Now, if uh, you're newish here, I just want to take a second to introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. You wonderful people. Amen. And I want to say hello to all of our Facebook family, all of our YouTube family. Come on, give it up for them right now. <laughs> Love you. Good to see you. Hey, I got one thing to say to you today before we get started. Dodgers. Come on, can I get an amen from the Lord right now? Come on, let's give it up for the boys in blue, yeah! Bunch of Giants fans in here probably. It's all right. I love you anyway. Hey, brother. All right. Somebody like, it's all right, I love you. Somebody said, I love you anyway just now. I think I heard that, so in case you didn't hear that in the, in the video, that's what they said. They're loving me anyways. So we're in this series called Be a Lifeline. Be a Lifeline where it's, it's more than just showing up. It's more than just contributing towards a lifeline, but I'm actually wanting us to understand more about what it takes to be a lifeline in the lives of others, in the lives of our family, at work, to be a lifeline. And it goes a little something like this. We were born again when we received God's lifeline. It's like God reached down and, and gave us a hand up when we were in our muck and our mire he, he raised us up and he set our feet on solid ground and we've got our hand on his. But you know, it doesn't stop there, you know, because we reach down again and we help out others when they need help too. And we're attached to the source and so we can be a lifeline because Jesus is our lifeline. Can I get one good solid amen to that? Please help me out here this morning. Second service, you need to, you had all the extra sleep you need. Go ahead, get funky with it. It's all right. So, I just want to let you know a little something. It's, it's not in my notes. It's not really about the message. I just wanted to bring you up to speed on something really cool that happened this week. Um, I went ahead and on the, on the topic of being a lifeline, I've been talking about this vision that we have, this vision that we have to open a detox, rehabilitation, and transitional living center right here in the city of Lodi. Amen. And at the, at the heart of which is a growing, thriving, life-giving church our church right here, and we'll be the heart of that center. So I've been, my eyes have been open to this. My ears have been open to this. I've been trying to get involved in our city and learn about what the city officials are, are thinking about this. But let me just tell you, I stopped in at a, a Lodi Chamber of Commerce meeting this last week because, hey, why not? <laughs> They're open door meetings, so I might as well just show up. So I did. And they started off by talking about Measure L. You've probably seen the signs. I I'm not here to tell you one way or the other about Measure L. I didn't go there for Measure L. I came there because I wanted to meet some of the people there. And it didn't take but 30 minutes for the conversation to go from a new tax being passed and the conversation turned to homelessness, drug addiction, and what we can do about it as a city. In every meeting, it turns, the conversation turns to that. You know what that tells me? God is on the move, on the move. Hallelujah. It's not just a song. God is on the move. He's trying to do something in our region. You know, we are a, we are a well-to-do city. Lodi is a well-to-do little, little clicky society where we've got everything going. But God is trying to do something new in us where we're not just given the lifeline. We don't just have the benefits, but we're actually learning to be a lifeline for those in need. And let me tell you something. The city cannot turn a blind eye to the things that are happening in our city. But let me give you something encouraging. The city is responding in such an encouraging way. They're hiring officers to, like, not arrest the homeless, but to give, to give help. Like their, their one job, there is actually a staff police officer that their one job is to go around and when they encounter a homeless person there, they talk through it, they, they, they see what the situation is, they see if they can help that person. Like that's their job, that's their staff job. The city did that. And so I'm super encouraged because I heard the city, no, I'm, I'm not gonna say who said it, but I was in that meeting. You're welcome, listening online. I didn't out you, you know, at the next uh, voting whatever. I heard somebody in a city position say, I would, spend, I would spend millions building a place if an organization would O&M, operate it and, and maintain, give maintenance. Operation and maintenance. O&M is operation and maintenance. If someone would operate and maintain a facility, we would build it. I was like, say what? 
<laughs> You're going to do what? Because I happen to know 100, 150 people that are kind of interested in something like that. It's called Lifeline Church. And they're like, well, we didn't know that. Well, now you do. And so let me just tell you, God is on the move. And Lifeline Church, it, we, we're getting out there. You are getting out there. And we are going to make a difference. I am confident in our lifetime, we will see this dream accomplished. So I just want to give an encouragement and a report to you on that on that thing, because we go every year, we do this series, Be a Lifeline. It's all about the vision God has given us. It's all about the culture that God has given us. It's all about the values that God has given us. And let me just tell you something. This is, this is moving into city government as well. God said to be in the world, not of it. Well, we're in our city. We're not of the city, but we're in our city. We're making a difference. And that's a real encouragement to me, as I hope it is to you. So, so let's get started with today's message. I want you to open up in your Bibles to Luke, no, excuse me, John 15. John 15, it's in your bulletin. You can get in there through YouVersion Bible app. You can follow along with our notes and little whatever, whatnot there, and it's in your bulletin. It's also on the screen. It's very easy to follow along today, but that's going to be our base text, so you can go ahead and follow along that way. And let me get started by asking you a quick question. Um, how many people have ever gone somewhere, like, let's say you were a kid. Have you ever gone to an amusement park as a kid and... You had to be this tall to ride the ride, but you were this tall. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe it's never happened to you, but maybe you've seen a little kid who wasn't tall enough to go on the ride. What's the result in that emotion? Would you, it's sad. It's really sad. The kid, you're crying. You're upset. But, you know, there are places in life, there are times in our lives where we go places, want to do things, but you're not tall enough. You're not educated enough. You're not the right gender. You're not experienced enough. I tell you uh, confidently because I came from drugs and alcohol. When I was trying to go and get a job, you got to be um, this much of not a dirt bag to work here with your criminal record. I'm like, come on, man, that's not very nice. Why would you say that? But, you know, we've all been in situations where we didn't feel like we were up to snuff. We didn't feel like we were up to par. Oh, I'm just a, I just get minimum wage or I'm a lady. They'll never take me on for that or I'm not experienced enough to do this, blah, 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 blah. And it's a very... It's a very uncomforting feeling to have. But let me tell you something that's even more discomforting, that's even more troubling. Going somewhere and thinking you're tall enough, going somewhere thinking you're educated enough, going somewhere thinking that you have all your stuff together, only to find out after you're there that you don't, only to find out later that you were not prepared. I was not tall enough to ride the ride because I slipped through the restraints and now I'm falling down off a Top Gun only to find out later. Let me tell you, that's much worse. It's much worse to think you're, you're far enough along, to think that you're better than you really are, to get yourself in a situation to find out I'm not as bad as I thought I was. That, my friends, is a very discomforting feeling and I can tell you that from experience. Let me tell you about my experience with that. So when I got saved, it was in 2007. We started pastoring this church in 2012. That's five years. So five years after getting saved, I was asked to pursue my pastor's license, to go and go through the whole process, see Foursquare, that's the kind of church you're in right now, it's a Foursquare church. We have a process, an interview process, where you go through and you meet with a panel and they ask you a bunch of questions, and they drill you, and they grill you, and they, they ask you all about it, and you're supposed to answer them appropriately. And that was my situation. But it just so happened that my, my coach was all of their boss. So I, what do you think I thought? I got this. I got this. Look how fast I'm moving up. Look how fast things are going for me. And I started to get stuck into a cycle that many people find themselves in. It's pride. Pride. You know what happened at that interview? It was a train wreck. It's like I fell out of the Top Gun ride because I found out later that I was not ready. You know, I, was, I got ready a little bit. You know, I typed it up. I had all the questions there, and I went through it, and I said, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. But when I went in there, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't ready because I thought I was ready. You know what I'm saying? I thought I was good enough. I thought, oh, man, I'm just walking up in here. I'm good enough. I'm good to go. Let me tell you something. This is not just something that I struggled with. I just wanted to level the playing field for us because I think that many Christians, many believers today equate showing up with growing up. 
They equate showing up with growing up. So just because I've been coming to church for a certain amount of time, oh, I'm good. I got this. You know, I ain't like, I ain't like them over there. Look at those people. They ain't good. I'm good. Look at me. I'm, they equate, and this is not any of you, of course, they equate showing up with growing up. And that is a dangerous game to play. That's a dangerous game to play. That just because that we've been around for a while, that that earns us a seat at the table, at the leadership table, or just growing in the Lord. Jesus seemed to think otherwise. Jesus seemed to think that it was the humble in spirit that got promoted the fastest. Jesus seemed to think it was the, it was the ones who, who considered themselves lowest that went the furthest and the fast, fastest. It was the religious Pharisees that were always getting <laughs> smacked by Jesus. You think you're so smart, don't you? And Jesus will get mad at them. Let me just tell you, I, I think that this is a problem that we face on a larger scale than we're ready to admit in the church today. And I want to address it. I want to address it. Let's talk about John 15. John 15. Let's go. Let's go. Starts in verse 1. It talks about if you are not connected to Jesus, you can accomplish nothing. But on the other hand, if you stay connected with him, you'll produce much fruit. But instead of explaining it, let me read it. John 15, starting in verse 1. He says, I'm the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. If you have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He said that like a bunch of times already. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Ouch. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. That's an interesting statement that we're going to come back to. When you produce much fruit, you're my disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. You may think you are attached to the vine in this place today, but the real test is this. Are you producing fruit in your life? Or another, thing, another way to say it is, what kind of fruit are you producing in your life? Because there's only two kinds. The Bible only talks about two different kinds of fruit, good and bad. Good and bad. You're either producing good fruit or you're producing bad fruit in your life. And you've got all of those, and you've got all of those things associated. You just look at that. See, the Bible talks about even looking at preachers, looking at prophets, looking at people. You'll know by their fruits what's going on with them. You'll be able to trust them, lean on them, consider what they say to be from me by the fruit in their life. And that goes for me. That goes from you listening to me. Look at the fruit in the life. And that goes for every single one of us as well. Look at the fruit. Consider the fruit. Let me say it another way. This is actually, this is actually very interesting. I want you to consider this. God created everything so we can learn from our surroundings too. All of creation, the revelation of creation can teach us this principle. We learn from this scripture and the natural revelation of creation this valuable point. Listen to this. Every living thing is either growing or dying. Every living thing is either growing or dying. Every living thing is either growing or dying. You know, just look at any, any tree. It's either green and producing more little tiny leaves and leaves are falling down and then it produces more. It's either growing. That's a growing tree. Or it's not. And we know, this, uh, we know this is true in, well, my weight. You know, I'm either losing it or gaining it. It seems like a human life cycle. Let's just talk about humanity for a second. Every human being is either growing or dying. You reach a certain point in your life where you stop growing and you start going the other way. It's just the way God made everything. 
every living thing is either growing or dying. Hmm, I wonder if this is also applicable to relationships and to our spiritual life. That we are either growing distant or growing deeper in our relationship with Jesus. I wonder if every living thing is either growing or dying, then we can ask ourselves this tough question. Am I growing deeper in my relationship with Jesus right now? Or am I growing distant? Let me, let me equate it with the relationship I have with my wife. My wife and I, I've been married long enough to tell you that if I am not actively pursuing her, if I'm not actively pursuing a relationship with her, like let's say instead of making time for date night and making time for dinner every night at the dinner table or things like this, but if I just come home, how you doing? Doing good. Turn on the TV. Go to bed. Wake up. Go to work. Come home. How you doing? Doing good. Go to bed. Wake up. Go to work. If we just go through those motions, is that relationship growing deeper? It's growing distant. Because every day I choose to show up instead of grow up in my relationship with my wife, that I'm actually teaching myself and teaching her distance, being stagnant, not growing. And that's exactly what happens in our relationship with Jesus. We go through the motions. Oh, I mean, you, you may even read your Bible. You may even do the certain things, but you just, uh, 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 and you've been doing it for years. I show up to church. I do this. I do that. And we, from the outside, it may even look like you're doing really good. Other people would look at your life and say, wow, wish I had this, wish I had that, wish I had, wish I was doing so good. Oh, you know some scriptures too. Oh, wow, so spiritual. But that's the same scripture you had memorized like 10 years ago. You see where I'm going with this? Like we are either continuing to grow and that makes it equal for everybody. So what I'm saying is, it's not necessarily where you're standing, how close you are to Jesus that counts. It's what direction you're going in that counts. So this kind of flies in the face. This kind of goes straight to people that have been saved five, six, seven, 10, 20, 30 years. You know what? That's not really, that's not really the marker, is it? The marker is what direction are you going? Are you continuing to pursue? You know, let's take a little test. Let's ask ourselves a couple of questions, and we could just do it privately, all right? You can answer in your heart. You can answer in your mind. Let's, let's, put it, let's put it against the word here. My question to you guys is this. What direction are you headed, and are you sure about that? Let's ask. Are you spending personal time with God, but is it more or less often? Are you learning more? every day about who he is or are you content with what you already know you don't have to answer out loud are you spending quality time with with other believers with his other children are you growing deeper in the relationship that you have with other believers are you doing that more or less often than you used to see most people when they first get saved are really excited and things are going really well and you're getting into every life group. And, oh, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to get a life group. I'm going to join the church. And I'm going to serve on a team. And it's going to be so good. And then five years goes by and you're like, oh, I got that. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just focusing on my family right now. You know, I'm just focusing on my job right now. I'm just, doing, I'm just doing me. And then you just grow distant from the Lord. So it's not really how long have you been saved. It's are you actively pursuing that relationship with him? Are you talking about him with people who need him? Are you sharing the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Are you sharing the good news with other people? Are you doing it more or less often than you used to? I, these are tough questions, I know, I know. But we, we, we've got to ask these things to ourselves. We cannot afford to show up without growing up. Because then, you know what that does? That turns us all into Pharisees, man. I don't want to be in a church with all Pharisees. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be one of those people that, that has this attitude of pride and puffed up like I think. I, but I'm not even growing. I'm not even open to learn new things. I'm not even open to do more. What, what do you mean join a 
you know, I need to go and pray more. I need to go to this meeting. I, need, I don't need to do that. I'm good. Look at me. I got pastor in front of my name. I don't need to do any of that stuff. I don't want to be that guy. You don't want me to be that guy. You don't want to turn out like that. But that's where a lot of us, without trying, we end up going. Because if we, because if we try and stand still, if we try and just protect what we have and maintain what we have, we're actually creating distance. We're actually creating distance. So this is my main point. This is the thing that I... If it's not written down in your bulletin, write it down again, even if it is. I don't even care. Just like every living thing is either growing or dying, in our relationship with Jesus, we are either growing deeper or we're growing distant. It's like this. Let's imagine it this way. You plant yourself a garden. Anybody got a garden? Anybody have a garden at their house? I got like two or three people with a garden. Okay, so this might be a little distant for you, but try and imagine, okay? You have a garden at your house, and you are planting watermelon. You got strawberries. You got peppers. You got squash. I don't know what you got. Whatever you like, you got that thing, and you're all excited about it, man. You built a little pine box. You put the right soil in there, and you, you cultivated the little seeds. You dug it just deep enough, and you just right, and you installed a drip system. Man, you are going all out. You got the drip system, and it's plugged in to a timer. Holy smokes, this garden is looking good from the gate. You even got shade where you need the shade, and then full sun where you need the full sun. You have gone all out. You got the best fertilizer. You got the right kind of light. You've got the best everything going on, and man, it is working for you. You got big, giant watermelons. You got the big, sweet strawberries. You got enough for you. You're eating them every single night with dinner, and you got enough for all your neighbors, too. It's going so good. And you're walking around town with, the, with your whole basket full of stuff, and you're just like, anybody want some? Yeah, check this fruit out. It's so good, isn't it? Don't you love it? Here, you want some? Here, I'll give you some, too. But then, you know, life happens. As it always does. And your drip system gets a tear in it. And so all the water's coming out here, and you're like, oh my gosh, I already did that. I don't have to fix that. And then there's a rip in the, in the sunscreen that you put up. You put up the sunscreen for the stuff that doesn't need as much sun, and there's a rip in that. So, the, so even the bugs are getting through, and you're like, oh man, I don't need to do all this stuff. The plants are already grown, they're big, they're strong, they'll be fine. Anybody who has a garden knows there's only one thing that grows without you trying, and that's weeds. Nobody wants it. It's good for nothing. It's even worse than nothing because if you just stand back and let whatever happen to your garden, let me just tell you, whatever will happen to your garden. It's going to be eaten by bugs. The weeds are going to grow up and take all the water. The fertilizer is going to run dry, and that soil is going to dry up, and let me tell you, your yield will be less. You'll have less fruit, less vegetables. It'll taste worse. Whatever you have will taste worse. And some of those plants are just going to flat out die. Some of them just won't make it. They'll die. All because you stopped giving the attention that was needed to produce good fruit. Jesus calls us plants like more than any other thing. Like, we need to have all this fruit. You're connected to the vine. Jesus seems to think, like, we're just another form of a plant. So let's go ahead and take that analogy a little bit further. Let's say that you are this pretty daisy. Who wants to? Whose favorite flower is a daisy? Anybody? This is a daisy. This is you right here. You are this plant. You are this plant. And what I want to do today is I want to give you three steps, three easy ways that you can take responsibility for your own salvation. Three easy ways for you to take responsibility for your own spiritual maturity. You don't want to do? I want to get rid of, I want to weed out the generation that just, not the generation, but a line of thinking that says show up instead of grow up. But I want to take responsibility for myself and my actions and my salvation and my spiritual depth. And I want you to as well. So what are three things we can do? Well, thing number one, to stay growing in Jesus, we need to stay growing in his word. We need to stay growing in his word. Reading God's word is like getting water every day. And let me just tell you something. Nothing will dry you up faster. Look at this cute little water 
thing. Have you ever seen something that cute? Look at that right there. Nothing will dry you up faster than not having daily Bible reading in your life. Nothing will dry you up. You would just be so dry and crusty without that word of God in your life. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know you've been waiting for this message for me to remind you that even just a little bit, just a little bit, this is so darling, isn't it? So darling. Just a little bit will do it. Just a, even a chapter a day, even a chapter a day. Really, it's based on your own capacity. It's based on your own capacity. You're not going to be judged by the ability of the person next to you. You're not going to be judged by your spouse's ability. You're not going to be judged by your spouse's knowledge. You're not going to be judged by your spouse's uh, or your friends or your anybody around you. You're going to be judged by what the Lord has spoken to you and where you're at, your level. So we all need to address our own salvation. That's what this whole message, addressing your own salvation, addressing your own spiritual depth. And I want you to know that in the Bible, the word is talked about like water. The Bible tells husbands to, to wash your spouse, your wife, in washing the water of the word. So there's like water in our lives where we can stay saturated. We want to stay saturated in God's word, everybody. That's what we want. We want a chapter a day minimum. So if you're not doing anything, I want to encourage you. A chapter a day is a good place to start. But if you're already reading, if you're just reading a chapter a day and you've been doing that for five years, I want to encourage you, man, get, get more in there. Man, step up your own, your own spiritual life. Wherever you're at, take it one more step because let me remind you, we're either growing deeper or we're growing distant, okay? Growing deeper or growing distant. Number two. Growing in humility. To stay growing in Jesus, we need to stay growing in humility. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about this. Humility is a way of making someone grow faster than is normal. Humility is like fertilizer to our life. You know, it doesn't always smell good either. Fertilizer kind of stinks when you have to handle it. You know, humility is a little stinky when you have to do it, but when even just a little bit of fertilizer can go a really long, don't shake my hand after the, after the service, by the way, I got fertilizer on it, don't worry about that, even just a little bit of fertilizer, like a little bit of humility can make you whoop, grow faster than anything else. Humility is the fertilizer of a Christian's life. I'll say that again because that is super important. Humility is the fertilizer in a believer's life. Let me just tell you something, and i got to tread lightly on this because I'm going to start to talk about my own humility, which that's a slippery slope right there. But let me just tell you, because, because I was a drug addict, and because I was an alcoholic, because I had done time, because I was a felon when I got, when I got saved, it was very easy for me to submit it was very easy for me to say, I don't have all the answers, so I, I'm willing to just submit to my leaders. I'm willing to just, because I didn't know anything, and I was perfectly okay with that. That's why it only took five years, and I had a call in my life, and I wanted to do all that, but let me just tell you, humility came naturally at first, but what happened else in my story? Remember what happened? I told you earlier. Pride. Pride came in. And what happened to me? <laughs> slap, slap. I went through that licensing and I got my pastor's license with an asterisk by it because I, it was a train wreck. It was awful. It was great. You know what that taught me? That taught me a valuable lesson. I mean, that was years ago now, but that could have been the single most important thing that happened in my spiritual life that I was faced with a time where I thought I had it all together. I thought I was doing fine. I thought I was doing great. And I began to just walk in this subtle sense of, I know what I'm doing. I got this. I've heard that message before. I, oh, he's talking, about, he's talking about pride and humility. He must mean Proverbs 3. I already, I already know where that is. Proverbs 3, 34. I already know. And if you start down that path, nothing, nothing will shut your life down faster. Nothing will shut your spiritual progress down faster than walking in pride. Than walking in pride. Yeah, Proverbs 3, 
34. It says, God exalts the humble, but he opposes the proud. He hates it. He hates pride. And he is willing to smack us around a little bit if we start walking in it. Or worse, leave you alone. And either one of those options don't sound good at all to me. No, I want to walk in humility. I want to put that fertilizer in my life where even if a person is younger than me, I'm willing to listen what they have to say. Even if a person has saved less time than me, I'm willing to listen to what they have to say and listen to them and actually give them credit. I'm willing to go to a conference. I'm willing to sit under another, another pastor and say, oh, that's a good point, instead of thinking about, oh, I could have preached it better. Oh, I, I could have said that better. Oh, you know, I've already heard that like three or four times, so I already know. I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. I, and that, that taught me that lesson at that time in my life. I'm praying right now that you, everyone here, would get that in their heart and just never let it go. Let that sink into your heart right now, that humility is the fertilizer that'll make you grow faster than any other thing. And if there's even a sniff of pride in your life, God will oppose it. He will oppose you if you walk in pride. And that's, that's really what this whole showing up over growing up thing or growing up over showing up thing is all about. So when we show up, we're actually just saying, I got this. I got this. I don't need to know more. I've been saved a long time. So that's the second thing we can do is we can grow in humility. The next thing we can do is we can grow in relationships. Growing in Jesus, growing deeper in Jesus means growing in relationships. Growing in relationships. You know, uh, Matthew 5 Starting in verse 14 and 16, you've all probably heard this before. Jesus talks about you are the light of the world. Anyone ever heard that? You are the light of the world, Jesus says to all of us. You are the light of the world. But what good is a light, right? What good is a light if you put it under a bowl, if you put it under a cup? Whatever your translation says, what good is light what good is the light I've given you if it doesn't shine out for everyone to see? See, some people love going outside. Some people love going out to the lake. Some people love going out to the river. I'm going to take my boat out. I'm going to take my sea dew out. I'm going to be out there with all the people. I'm going to high five people I don't know. I'm going to be in the checkout line, and I'm going to be meeting people right there. I'm going to be like, oh, nice shoes, honey, in the checkout line. I'm going to talk to them. Some people love to talk with new people. But for the rest of us, normal people, we have to muster up the courage and the energy to do that. Now, some people don't know this about me. You may see me up here on the platform and you think, oh, that dude, oh yeah, no problem. He's probably out there talking to everybody and I do like people, but you know what? I'm not as extroverted as most of you probably think I am. Let me just tell you the truth is that when I go out places and when I'm going to be in crowded places, crowded rooms and crowded places, I actually have to psych myself up a little bit to be there. Anybody relate? Yeah, a lot of you probably. And I do the same thing. But I have to remind myself this scripture, what good is light if it stays home all day every day? What good is light if it doesn't shine forth for all to see? Man, we need that light shining in our lives, yeah? But we also want it to shine through our lives. We want the light to shine through, to permeate through us. He is the light of the world, and he shines through us. And growing deeper in our relationship with him means having a heart for people around us. Man, there's people out there that are hurting, broken, lost, and lonely. They need the gospel. They need the good news. But we're not, like, in the mood to talk to people? Like, oh, I've done all that. You know, the, the statistics say the longer you're saved, the less you witness to people. The longer you're saved, the less likely you are to give any of those cards out to people. That's just what the statistics say. Every year you're saved, you talk to less people about your faith. Because people who are new are humble, hungry, and they're more willing to give away what was freely given to them. But the longer you're saved, the more you start thinking... Well, you know, if they wanted it, man, they'd just go and get it, like I did. Like I did. They need to just step up and do that. They'll, they'll be fine. You know, the longer it goes on. But that's why we have to stay intentional. That's why we have to tell ourselves, especially if you've been saved any length of time, 
We have to tell ourselves that I'm the light of the world and I have the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I have that news inside of me. And when I am not in the mood to share it, somebody dies. Aren't you glad somebody shared it with you? Let me put it that way. Did somebody share the good news with you at one point in your life? Pretty much everybody in this room is going to raise their hand. Yes. So why aren't we doing it more often? Because we just, we show up. I'm going through the motions. Hey, I do it too. You know how much courage I have to do to, to take out one of those cards and give it to the silly person at Taco Bell? I get, ooh, I get all nervous every time, every time. But I never regret doing it. And I make myself do it because I, I understand this one thing. I'm either growing deeper in my relationship with Jesus or I'm growing distant. And I don't want to be that guy. And I don't think you want that either. I, don't, I know you don't. I know you don't. That if I, if I ask any one of you personally, hey, do you want to grow deeper in the Lord? You'd say yes. You'd say yes. So I'm giving you three things that you can do as you walk out of this house of God today. You can give yourself more of the word. You can water yourself more frequently, more often. You can give yourself water so you're not dried up. A chapter a day. If you're already doing that, do two. Do a couple more verses. Read in the morning and at night. I don't know. It's up to you. It's on you. You're not going to be judged based on my ability. You're going to be judged based on your ability. So give yourself that word. The fertilizer of that humility, man. Don't miss that. If anybody misses that, man, I'm going to say it over and over again. Be humble. Be humble. Humble yourself. Don't push it so that you have to be humbled. Don't, nobody wants that. And let your light shine. Let God's light shine through you. And if we can do these things, because just like every living thing is either growing or dying, our relationship with Jesus is either growing deeper or growing distant. Let's be intentional about growing deeper in our relationship with Jesus and our relationships with others today. Now, let me tell you what I see. Actually, um, I know that God has given me the ability to see things that don't exist yet. It's being having vision, being able to see, you know, a grandeur recovery center. That God has given me that, that gift, and I have to steward that gift. I have to manage that gift. I have to take care of that gift. But let me share another vision I have, a, a vision for y'all, a vision for every single person here. I have a vision of every single person who, who is associated with Lifeline Church forsaking, showing up, and embracing growing up. I see a whole generation being raised after us where we're not just teaching the ones coming along. We're not teaching our kids. We're not teaching our friends' kids. We're not teaching them that just being here is the answer. But, you, but taking responsibility. I, 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 see, I see us moving on from ever thinking, and that would be so far from our thinking that just, just showing up someplace like I'm in the garage, that makes me a car? Never. That would never be true. That's not true. That's silly to think that. So why does being here make you a Christian? It doesn't. It doesn't. What did Jesus say about being a disciple? They will know you by your fruit. What kind of fruit? He's talking about what kind of fruit is in your life? Are you watering? Are you pruning? Are you putting fertilizer? Are you giving light? Are you producing fruit in your life? Take a look at your own life. And you can be the judge. Am I, am I producing good fruit? How many people got saved because of me? How many people are growing deeper in their relationship with Jesus because of me? Who am I talking with? Just one person right now. Who am I talking with about the Lord in my life who, who doesn't already have salvation in their life? Who am I just intentionally talking with? You know, these are tough questions, and I think a lot of us would, almost every single person here, myself included, has places that we can grow. And that's the beauty of it. We never really arrive. We, we get to be on this growing journey for the rest of our lives. And let me tell you, that's a good thing. That means we get to continue experiencing next levels all the way until we get to glory. We get to keep on experiencing God's, God's grace and mercy in new ways. We never arrive at this place where, oh, well, I've, got, I've done everything and I know everything, so I'm good. We never get there, and that's good news. That means life stays spicy. Life stays fun. We get to keep growing in him, and that's beautiful. I love it. And that's my vision for the church. 
is that we would be self-feeders, that we would learn to take care of ourselves. Now, I don't need a gardener to show up to make sure I'm getting enough water in my life. I can do that. I don't need someone to show up to make sure I'm, I'm getting enough light and I'm, and I'm being the light to people. No, I'm going to be responsible for that. I don't need someone to come and fertilize my own lawn. No, I'm going to take care of me. I am going to take care of my own spiritual walk. And that's, the, that's, that's growing up, not just showing up. Become a self-feeders. Like, I, I am growing in the Lord because of what I've committed to do. Let me put it to you this way. If you want a better relationship with Jesus, you can have it. It's not dependent on anyone else. It's not dependent on your circumstances. It's not dependent on your pay rate. It's not dependent on what job you have. It's not dependent on what pastor you have. It's not dependent on what church you go to. If you want a deeper relationship with Jesus, you can have it. That's on you. That's what I came to tell you today, is it's up to you. These are three ways, not the only ways. These are three ways you can do it. If you want that, you can have it. I see an opportunity for stagnant relationships with Jesus to be transformed today. You know what stagnant means? You know what stagnant water looks like, smells like, feels like? It's slimy. Nobody wants to touch it. It's nasty. No one's going to drink it. I mean, you might get sick if you drink it. When you step your foot in it, it's got some texture to it. Stagnant is never what, I'd lo- what I want my relationship with Jesus to to be like. I don't want my relationship with Jesus to be stagnant water. I want it to be flowing, growing, eroding away all that, all that nastiness in my life where my relationship with Jesus is growing and that water is coming through and is cleaning me, purifying me. I see stagnant relationships being transformed and made new today. It's a choice you can make and you can decide to make that choice right now. So in the moment, I'm going to, I'm going to ask every single person here to, to, Actually, you know what? Let's pray right now. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me because this is what I want to do. I want to pray with you today because I'm going to offer salvation in a second. I'm going to offer, I'm going to offer the, the true nature of Jesus to every single person here, but I'm also going to give an opportunity for every single person here to turn a new leaf. We've been talking about plants. Let's just keep it going there. Turning a new leaf, saying, yeah, I have been stagnant. I have been holding still for a little while, and I'm ready to go deeper in my relationship with Jesus. But also, I want to offer to every single person, if you've never heard of Jesus like this, if you've never heard that God sent his one and only son to die for you personally, then that is the good news. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died on a cross for our sins, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. That God didn't send his son to judge the world. He came here to save the world and to save us and to save you. So I pray right now for for open hearts and anybody who wants to give their life to Jesus once and for all and say, you know what? I want to start growing and I want my relationship with Jesus to start right now. If that's anybody here, you can go ahead and indicate that to me with a raising of your hand. Amen. You know what else I want to pray? I want to pray for any person here that wants to turn a new leaf. That says, yeah, I, I have, I've been waiting. I've been on a holding pattern. And it's very possible that I've been growing distant. Even though I'm at church today, I've been growing distant in my relationship with Jesus. If your heart's cry today is that you want to grow deeper in the Lord, I want you to go ahead and lift your hand up. It's a first step to say, you know what? I'm ready to go deeper in the Lord. Go ahead. You can do this. Amen. I see people ready to turn over a new leaf today, and I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray over every single person here who's ready to turn a new leaf and say, I will now take responsibility for my relationship with you. I will no longer stand by and rest in what I used to know. Rest in what I was raised in. Rest in, in the fact that I've just been saved a long time. But I will take responsibility for my spiritual life. And I will up my spiritual game because I love you, God. And God, you love me. And I want to pursue my relationship with you, God. You are worth it. You are holy. 
You are God, and I give you here and now every single thing in my life that's standing in the way of my relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. Let's clap for people.